Hi, my name is Shutik, and I'm sick of everybody making comments about my toupee. Today we're looking at this. A Fender 6G15 Standalone Reverb Clone. Originally introduced in 1961, this unit sends your guitar's signal across a set of springs, giving your sound everything from a mild sense of space to that drippy surf reverb that the unit is so well known for. The unit boasts a three-tube complement consisting of a 12AT7 preamp tube, a 6K6GT reverb driver, and a 12AX7 reverb recovery tube. For those who are paying attention to the details, you might note that the schematic shows a 7025 tube for the reverb recovery tube. The 7025 is just a low noise 12AX7, and either option will work just fine. If you're planning on going the extra mile for a NOS 7025, be prepared to sell some of your grandmother's heirloom underwear to get one. Not all builds go smoothly, and for me, this was one of those. It wasn't the complexity of this one that gave me trouble. It's really not a whole lot different than a Fender Champ at its core. What was difficult was getting the noise floor of the unit to a level I found acceptable. In today's video, we're going to cover some extensive build notes and mods which I've compiled to help you get the most out of your 6G15 build. Let's take a look at what we're working with here. There are three controls on the standalone reverb. Dwell is the strength of the reverb effect. More dwell will result in a longer reverb. If you really crank the dwell, you'll start to drive the tank and circuit into saturation, which will yield that drippy surf rock sound. Mix is how much of the reverb signal is mixed with the dry signal. This can result in tone suck if certain steps aren't taken. More on that later. Tone controls the brightness of the reverb. Let's try something with the dwell cranked up to get that nice drippy sound. There are a few techniques you can use to get around some limitations on your standalone reverb. A lot of 6G15 blackface users will encounter a phenomenon known as tone suck. SurfGuitar101.com does an excellent job of explaining this. As the mixer control is turned up from zero, additional resistance is placed in series with the output of the dry signal path, the cathode follower. This additional resistance forms a low-pass RC filter with the capacitance of the cable used to connect the reverb unit to the amplifier. The resultant filter removes high frequencies from the dry signal, an effect known as tone suck. There are two ways I know of to get around this. Your first option is to use a high-quality, low-capacitance cable between the unit and the amp. The shorter, the better. The second way to mitigate tone suck is by using a short patch cable and a buffer coming out of the reverb tank. This could either be a dedicated buffer pedal or a pedal with a built-in buffer you already own. For example, if you have a pile of Klon clones laying around, you could slap one after the tank and leave it in the off position to take advantage of its buffer. One thing worth mentioning is that there was also a Silverface unit in the 70s that had an additional 12AX7 for a total of four tubes. My understanding is that this fourth tube acts as a buffer and helps to alleviate some of the tone issues. 
I haven't had the opportunity to play one of these, so I couldn't tell you how well this additional tube buffer performs. Lastly, you can also use a foot switch to turn the reverb on and off. I have found this to be very loud and buzzy. I'm either using the reverb or not, and I don't gig with this, so I never have a reason to plug the switch in. Let's try something that gives the guitar a sense of space. For my build, I used a Triode 6G15 kit. The Triode website currently looks like the digital equivalent of an aneurysm. They never pick up when I call or respond to my email inquiries, so I'm not even sure if they're still in business. The kit I received from them was missing a ton of parts and came with the wrong impedance reverb tank. While Triode did eventually make everything right, it took over a month of back and forth communication and multiple shipments to get all the correct parts. There are other reports on the forums with people having similar experiences. If they are still around, I wouldn't recommend their kit because it's just too much of a pain in the ass to do business with them. It's kind of a shame because all the parts are high quality and their kit has a really nice turret board. If you're looking for a kit, Mojo Tone and Weber each offer one that will get the job done. You could also grab a turret board from Hoffman Amps and source all the other parts yourself. Initially, I built my 6G15 exactly how it appears on the schematic. When I plugged it in for the first time, I wasn't impressed. The reverb sounded decent, but the unit produced way too much noise for my tastes. This led me to several modifications which greatly improved the noise floor and overall sound of the unit. Now, for the mods. First up is the Half Wave to Full Wave Bridge Rectification mod. There's a guy over on the TDPRI forums named Tubeswell who was able to provide me with a ton of guidance on how I could improve my 6G15. Here's what he had to say about the full wave bridge mod. Modifying the unit from half wave to full wave bridge rectification results in less ripple current due to the doubling of DC pulse frequency from the rectifier compared to what is available with half wave rectification. I had to use full wave bridge rectification because my power transformer didn't have a center tap. If your PT has a center tap, you can do standard full wave rectification. Here's a wiring diagram for a full wave bridge rectified 6G15 using a PT without a center tap. Special thanks to Jay Bennett on the Surf Guitar 101 form who created this. Next up is the hum loop blocker. The idea here is that we're separating the low current and high current returns in an effort to reduce ground loop hum. Per tubes well, it's important to separate the returns in clusters this way in order to minimize the micro wobble present in the high current returns from interfering with the low current returns and the low current returns filter cap. Otherwise, any AC micro rises and ground potential from the high current returns can get reverse shunted into the B plus rail for the preamp from the preamp filter cap riding on a higher AC ground return current. Let's take a look at the hum loop blocker. Here we have a bus bar created out of a piece of household electrical wire I had kicking around attached to a terminal strip. Attached to the bus bar are my high current returns on the right and my low current returns on the left. The bus bar then attaches to the hum loop blocker, which consists of a capacitor, resistor, and a set of diodes. These four parts all attach to ground. Oh, 
and this Dijon cap here is ridiculous looking. It's just what I had on hand at the time. Here this is in schematic form as provided to me by Tubeswell for reference. You'll also need to isolate the quarter inch phone and RCA jacks for the hum loop blocker. You can buy insulators for the phone jacks, but you'll need to purchase special isolated RCA jacks for that part of the job. The insulators and the special RCA jacks didn't fit in the pre-drilled holes on my chassis, so I had to drill them out to be slightly larger. For this, you'll need drill bits which are designed to drill through stainless steel. You'll also want to make sure you provide resistance on the inside of the chassis before you drill. You can do this by stacking and wedging multiple pieces of wood underneath the hole inside the chassis. I didn't do this on my first try and I bent and twisted the chassis. I had to bend and hammer it back into shape. The scuffed lettering on the control panel serves as a continuous reminder of what happens when I do things outside of the supervision of my handler. Lastly, I played around with a ton of different reverb tanks. Make sure you select one with the correct impedance. For the standard 6G15, that'll be an 8 ohm in, 2250 ohm out tank. You have the choice to mount horizontally or vertically. Make sure you mount the tank the way it was designed to be mounted. The tanks are designed to be installed in their ideal mounting plane and will not perform to spec if mounted incorrectly. You can also choose from tanks with different decays with the most common choices being medium or long. Finally, you can place the tank in a bag if you want. This is supposed to give the tank better isolation resulting in a more full sound. I personally can't tell the difference when it comes to home studio use. It probably makes more of a difference if you're playing live. In the end, I landed on an Accutronics and Belton 4AB 3C 1C long decay vertical wall mount tank without a bag. This was a very challenging and rewarding build. By trying to reduce the noise floor of the unit, I was forced to learn a ton about rectification, grounding, and even a little bit about impedance. If you're down for an educational experience, this could be a fun project for you. While I think it's really cool having a standalone reverb tank, I can see how it could be tough to justify the price point or the effort required to own one. Some of the digital options out there definitely give the 6G15 a run for its money and can offer up more reverb types than just spring. The pedals are also a lot less fussy with where they are placed in your effects chain. So, do I recommend building a 6G15? Sure, but only if you're going to actually use it on a regular basis. I really enjoy how this thing sounds, but I probably don't use it enough to justify owning it. That said, I would never sell it. It's a fine piece of hardware and it gives me easy access to the definitive spring reverb sound. Okay, bye!